Good morning, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project Magnetic Reversal News and Shinrin Yoku bringing you a Grand Solar Minimum update Friday, September 16th, around 3 p.m. Mountain Time 2022. The entire east coast of the U.S. is covered in haze from wildfire smoke in the west, plus a few large M flares blasting off the sun from a spot turning around the limb. So none of this geo-effective. But the big story, winter is coming. Colorado mountains get their first dusting of snow Thursday. Keep calm. It's winter time. It's true. First snowfall for Colorado high country wets the winter appetite, and it is gorgeous as well. And there's more snow through the rest of September on the GFS models, including the Sierras and the Northern Rockies. Snow is likely in Yellowstone, Wyoming mountains as summer draws to a close. We just showed you the models. Smoke again impacting Lake Tahoe air quality. Rain and high elevation snow expected this weekend. And the hazy skies over Pennsylvania are from the western fires, as we pointed out. Specifically those burning in Northern California and Oregon and Idaho. So take a look at the haze from Rochester, New York, all the way down to the Florida Panhandle. It is smoky. It's also smoky up here in northern Canada and a western spot here from Salt Lake City to Sacramento is the heaviest smoke in the U.S. So if it's hazy outside, now you know why. Atlantic Tropical Cyclone Outlook. Here is Tropical Storm Fiona and it is just off the Leeward Islands there. Tropical storm conditions are expected across the Leeward Islands within the warning area and you can see that warning area here. Um, and that starts this afternoon. It will spread westward across the U.S. Virgin Islands on Saturday and Puerto Rico late Saturday and Saturday night. Tropical storm conditions are possible over Dominica tonight and in the British Virgin Islands on Saturday. So heavy rains from Fiona will reach the Leeward Islands by this evening, spreading from the British and U.S. Virgin Islands to Puerto Rico Saturday, reaching the Dominican Republic Sunday and the Turks and Caicos Monday. Fiona is expected to strengthen gradually over northeastern Caribbean Sea and could be near hurricane strength as it approaches the southern coast of the Dominican Republic. Now, it is now, there are some models that show that it may hit the U.S., but let's take a look at those spaghettis now. Just as we would have it, they are updating the spaghetti models now, so we can't pull any of those up. But the National Hurricane Center here does have that cone of warning, and you, we can see how it is moving up through the Virgin Islands here uh, over the next few days. Eventually, according to this, turning into a hurricane by Monday. So that's what's going on there. And if you live in that region, well, stay tuned for more updates as the storm develops. Historically powerful Alaska storm and Fiona approaching the Leeward Islands. Typhoon Murbach has transitioned into a historically powerful Alaskan storm in the Bering Sea. Significant damaging high winds and storm surges are expected to slam into southwestern Alaska, especially along the southern Seaward Peninsula. Tropical Storm Fiona will move through the Leeward Islands, then is expected to pass near Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands later this week. So heads up, let's take a look at Alaska and see what's going on there. Now here we can see that massive low pressure system here. Holy macaroni. And I can see why this is definitely going to be a historic storm. Take a look at how close these, mil oh, my goodness. And there it is going to spin around and it looks like the eye of the hurricane here, 955 millibars. That is going to go right through the, the bearing straight there. That is just like a bullseye. So I would not want to be on a ship anywhere in this region at this time. And it doesn't look like much snow is going to come up, up to this, but let's take a look at the precipitation total um, and see if there's going to be... There is some flooding potential here. We're looking for six to eight inches of rain in some areas as this system moves in. And then here you can see down here by June... I think this is by Juno. Could be 12 to 14 inches of rain through the 22nd. That's just in the next six days. Holy macaroni. And that is because of Typhoon Mer Merbach. And Merbach is looking pretty significant. Let's take a look at that again, the pressure on that storm as we roll this back. And it comes through the Bering Sea there. Sitting at 941 right now. That is pretty amazing. 943. 
955 when it goes through and 963 when it goes through the Bering Strait. It literally, the low pressure center is going to go right through the Bering Strait. What are the odds of that? Seismic update. No quakes to note. We have a rumbler here, 5.0 in India at 10 kilometers. That may have broken some buildings, but all is quiet on the western front. Little, little active, flurry of activity here in Hawaii, uh, as well as a 5.1 in Micronesia, but nothing significant. We do have some volcanic uptick. Home reef volcano in Tonga. A submarine eruption has led to form a new island. Pretty fantastic. The Tonga Geologic Service has reported that a new submarine eruption at the volcano started on the 10th of September at 1.39 local time, judging from the gas column detected in satellite images. The ongoing submarine activity resulted to form a new volcano island at 12.59 p.m. local time with a diameter of 70 meters, emerging approximately 10 meters above sea level. There is a new island in Tonga. So I wouldn't want to move on it just yet. It's looking pretty active as Gamalama, Gamalama volcano in Indonesia has elevated seismic activity. I've never heard of Gamalama, so let's look a little bit into this volcano and see if it's something to worry about. Here we are at Gamalama Ding Dong, the volcano in Indonesia in question. I, I hope you don't say it that way, but let's just go with Gamalama. Uh, and let's check the eruptive history of Gamalama. Just a VEI 1, 2 volcano here, a VEI 3 back in 83, and nothing other than that. Another VEI 3 back in 1840, VEI 3 in 1775. So this doesn't have a very large potential, but could erupt up to VEI 3. The last eruption reported was 2018 at VEI 1 at Gamalama Ding Dong. So Gamalama in Indonesia elevated seismic activity, and home reef volcano in Tonga, a, the, the Earth's newest island. Yes, the newest volcanic island emerging just today, or yesterday. And here we are at Space Weather, solarham.net, and you can see the uptick in the X solar flare detection. This is the GOES-16 X-ray flux, two M flares. In fact, an M7.9 was the first flare, a moderately strong solar flare in terms of peak X-ray strength was observed at AR3098, which is now turning onto the west limb and is now out of view. The M7.9 flare peaked at 949 UTC, September 16th. It does not appear to be very eruptive, other than the brief radio blackout across the HF spectrum. No major impacts to our planet should be expected from this. And then a second M flare detected around the same region at M6.2, pointing even further away at that point. So... That's what we got going on here. We have some sunspot development on the disk. And active region 3102, it would be the one in question that we would be concerned with. So there is your space weather news. Two M flares, not geo-effective, not really going to affect us at all. And here we are at ISWA where they're modeling. It's ni neither of those M flares. This is a filament release from the other day. That is not going to hit us either. So... Good news there. It will hit Mars quite significantly, so maybe we'll see some interesting effects when it smashes into Mars on the 20th of September. A September, to remember. Now, while video shows the dance of Alaskan Northern Lights in real time, and this was captured on Sunday, which is your fun day. Absolutely kind of fantastic. We have even better aurora from Iceland at the same time. That's nice. In video we don't really want to hear that guy but this is some aurora ropes dancing around in alaska on sunday all the links to everything we show you will be linked below and now he's just trying to get us dizzy so here we are northern lights dazzle over iceland well young enough to remember so Links be, will be below to all these videos as we move on to more science insights. Space Probe proves Alabama scientist was right about the solar wind. And the thing in question we're looking at here is a plasma rope with a kink. Yes. European scientists have confirmed an Alabama astrophysicist, and no, it's not Green's Greg, but I'm sure Greg, Greg knows him. He was right two years ago with his model of strange spikes in the solar wind. The stream of protons and electrons coming from the sun's outmost atmosphere or corona. Now the phenomenon is called a solar switchback and it's the first time it has been directly observed. And there is that direct observation right there. Zing, 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 zing. Solar switchback. 
Um, six times faster than a Category 5 hurricane and super hot, the solar wind smacks the Earth's atmosphere when it happens. As one NASA scientist put it, not enough is known about it. One reason the solar orbiter is there, but we know it is responsible for triggering those majestic auroras typically seen at some locations on the North and South Poles. And we just looked at some of those. Now, a solar switchback is a move within a move or a propagating kink in a magnetic field, Zank said, with the most extreme case being an almost S-shaped kink in the field line that reverses its direction twice, according to Zank. It's somewhat complicated wave within an unusual waveform, and that is, I guess, what they're claiming is happening there. One of those kinks, I guess, because it's the first time it's been ever observed, and an Alabama scientist, well, he got it right. Scientists discover a 380-million-year-old heart, stunningly preserved. This is another huge breakthrough. The next oldest heart is 280 million years younger. So this is an amazing breakthrough, bringing back, um, I mean, amazing breakthrough in paleontology, pushing the limits of what we can glean from fossils. A 380 million year old fish heart found embedded in a chunk of Australian sediment has scientists' pulses racing. Not only is this organ in remarkable condition, but it could also yield clues about the evolution of jawed vertebrates, which include you and me. And that's kind of interesting. And here is not the picture, but this is actually, see the, the spiral? An intestine of the same fish. Now, paleontologists encountered the fossil during a 2008 expedition at the Gogo Formation, and it adds to a trove of information gleaned from the site, including the origins of teeth and insights into the fin-to-limb transition. The Gogo Formation is a sedimentary deposit in the Kimberley region of Western Australia, and it's known for its rich fossils record-preserving reef life from the Devonian period of the Paleozoic era, including relics of tissue as delicate as nerves and embryos with umbilical cords. So there you have it. And what I find interesting is the picture of the fish looks like this here, but that's not what we're looking at here. Just a coincidence. Now, some conspiracy theories. Hundreds of these ancient stone structures dot the Scottish Highlands. But the true purpose of Brooks continues to baffle experts. If you travel north through the Scotland's deep glens, its mist and mountains, and its velvety moorland, and you'll eventually see them, crumbling stone towers rising against the highland peaks like ancient crag-top castles. These mysterious Iron Age monuments are known as brooks, and they exist nowhere else on earth but here. Yet while these circular, dry-walled structures are as symbolic a feature as any in the Scottish Highlands, their purpose still, to this day, remains a mystery. What is known is that around 2,000 years ago, local tribes started harvesting local stone to build massive prehistoric buildings with walls 5 meters thick and stretching 13 meters high. To date, anywhere from 100 to 500 brook sites have been identified with the densest concentration centered in Scotland's northern Caithness and Sutherland counties, as well as the Northern Isles. Now, they, archaeologists once thought that these brocks, whose name is derived from the lowland Scottish word for fort, were citadels of local chieftains. But more recent ex uh, excavations suggest that the structures were more likely used for residential use. So what is this for? If your house is here, what is this for? Is it for uh, when asteroids start raining from the sky, perhaps, or 150-mile-an-hour winds with lightning? That's my best guess. I think that these brooks are the same as the dolmens and serve the same purpose. If you have enough money to buy a house and you know that if you don't build a brook, you're all going to die anyway, why build the house? That's just my two cents. Now, this is horrifying. We know glyphosate is bad. I mean, 15 years ago, I began organizing against the most dangerous and corrupt multinational corporation on the planet at the time, and it was Monsanto. 
They had killed thousands, if not millions of people legally at that time. And they had taken over world governments through a revolving door process over uh, uh, those multinational corporations where the CEO of Monsanto eventually gets in as the head of the FDA and then back to the Monsanto and it's just on and on, the corruption. But it's on purpose, it's for depopulation. And we now know that a commonly used agricultural herbicide glyphosate can cross the blood-brain barrier. Not only is it carcinogenic, but it is completely toxic to the body and neurodegenerative. Now, neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's are among the most puzzling in medical research, but it may, the increase may be due to glyphosate. And this is just one um, revelation amongst many. And guess what? No one will be held accountable. The entire food supply, including the organic food supply, is currently contaminated with glyphosate. It is in all food products, and some products in boxes and some of the most popular products bought in the United States are actually banned worldwide. Some of our cereals. Did you know that goldfish, a very popular for children and even infants, has the highest residual glyphosate of almost any food on earth? And yet millions of thoughtful and responsible parents feed this to their children without even knowing what they're doing. So just a heads up, know what you're eating because you are what you eat. And some more common sense before we leave. I thought you would enjoy this. We want to go all electric by 2035. Is it practical to do it now? Well, we can make this whole discussion easy with the two-letter word, no. There's no such thing, of course, as a zero emissions vehicle. The real question is, where are the emissions associated with the electric car? Because what you do with an electric vehicle is you don't eliminate emissions, you export them somewhere else. You have to dig up about 500,000 pounds of materials to make a single 1,000-pound battery. It takes 100 to 300 barrels of oil to manufacture a battery that can hold one barrel of oil equivalent of energy. Just manufacturing the battery can have a carbon debt rate ranging from 10 tons to 40 tons of CO2. And the plans that are in place to increase the use of batteries will require an increase in production of minerals like lithium, cobalt, zinc. Demand for those minerals will increase between 400% and 4,000%. Isn't there enough mining in the world to make enough batteries for that many people for their car? Clown world. What are your thoughts? Leave them below. All links to everything we talked about will be below the video. I want to thank each and every one of you for watching. Thanks to our one-time donors, especially our Patreons that support the work we do. Without you, we wouldn't be making these types of videos so often. So thank you. Become a hero and share the video. And we'll see you soon. That's a boo. Mm -hmm.